Hey folks, it's that time again. It's time for another session of getting to know Dynatrace. So it's uh, it's been a long summer. I haven't had an opportunity to do many of these sessions over the summer. We've been so busy traveling, going off far off places, been to Denver, California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, all over the place. We have had a amazing summer, but it's like I said, been too long since we've had a getting to know Dynatrace session. I'm really happy that you've all tuned in today for today's session. Now, as always, with getting to know Dynatrace sessions, there's a couple of things up front. These are interactive sessions. And so what makes them really special are the questions that you ask. So whatever channel that you're coming in and listening to us on, whether or not it's LinkedIn or YouTube or Facebook or Twitch or Twitter X or whatever it's called these days, so whatever channel it is, feel free to ask us a question. And that question is going to pop up in behind the scenes here, and we'll do our best to answer them. That's really what Getting to Know Dynatrace is all about. <laughs> but as always with Getting to Know Dynatrace, we have a couple of upfront segments that we like to start off with. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen here. Let's get this going. And there we go. Getting to know Dynatrace. Why is that in the top right? I don't know. Anyways, the first segment of getting to know Dynatrace is what's new. Now, as always with this segment, we always start off with pointing people to the Dynatrace blog. So go to the Dynatrace blog. Here's the link. It's right here. It's dynatrace.com slash news slash blog. And that's where you're going to get all of the information and new things about what's going on here at Dynatrace. This is not just product information. This is also industry information, information about the company itself. There's lots of exciting things that have been happening over the past couple of months. As a matter of fact, if I just sort of flip my screen over here and go into the blog and we start scrolling through this, you can see what I'm talking about. Like right off the bat, you know, most recent uh, content that we posted up here, there's a great article on predictive AI. We actually did announce that this summer. The whole idea of having multiple types of AI combined into what we call a hypermodal uh, AI. And what this essentially allows us to do is to apply different AI techniques for very specific use cases where we might have a causal deterministic AI that allows us to uncover where uh, problems might be occurring, or we might have some classic machine learning uh, AI that is being used to actually monitor a time series and perhaps project out some results. And now we're starting to include that generative AI to allow you to be able to ask you know, questions of the data that are going to provide answers in ways that you haven't even thought of before. So very, very exciting news on what we're doing on the AI front. In addition to this, you can see here, there's been multiple releases of Dynatrace over the course of the summer. So there's all sorts of release notes. You can see here, um, you know, we've got uh, an article that's talking about Dynatrace and how we use it, uh, Dynatrace in Google to um, you know, uh, uh, basically unleash cloud native observability for GKE Autopilot. I know that's been coming up in conversations all the time. But again, I can just keep scrolling through page after page after page of blog articles. There's just so much new content that uh, we've been producing over the summer. So we've been super busy. And you know, this is a great place to, to learn what's new here at Dynatrace. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about, let me get back into my presentation here, uh, on the what's new section is it's it's we're into the we're we're heading into the fall. I know it's really hot outside for some folks, like for us here. I was just saying to some of the folks on the call that it's about a, <laughs> it felt like a hundred and ten degrees the other day. Uh, super hot. I know it feels like summer, but we're heading into that fall winter season, and when we head in that fall winter time frame. You know what it's time for? It's time for us to start talking about Perform. Perform 2024 in Las Vegas. We have a new venue this year. We, we've grown this event so much that we grew out of the venue that we've been running it for the past number of years. And now we're at the Aria Hotel. So keep this in mind. January 29th to February 1st, 2024 in Las Vegas in person is going to be Dynatrace Perform. Now, Dynatrace Perform, obviously, um, you know, this is something that we host, but this is very much a, a, an industry-based 
um, uh, uh, um, oh, having a moment here. Uh, this is a industry-based show where basically we talk, we get customers, our customers, who come in from all sorts of different segments. Um, we have banks that come in. We have people that are into travel, airlines. We have retailers. We have public service organizations. They all come together and start talking about observability, AI, and Dynatrace. And it's an amazing session. As a matter of fact, some of the best parts of the session are the hands-on training days. Those are the first couple of days of Dynatrace Perform where you have an opportunity to sit down and learn something new with Dynatrace hands on, you know, in a classroom type session where you're sitting there and you have an instructor leading you through exercises. Those are those are some of our best reviewed um, um, uh, parts of uh, perform. So keep that in mind. End of end of January, beginning of February in Las Vegas, Dynatrace perform 2024. So let's move on to the next segment. And the next segment is Did You Know? Now, this one is kind of a trick. I'm tricking you with this one because it's actually partly what's new as well. So it's not just did you know, but it's also a what's new thing because this one is kind of new. And that is, did you know that you can avoid billing surprises with smart Dynatrace cost monitors? This is something that has been coming up in conversation across the observability world. And that is, how do you keep your costs in line when you're looking at your observability data? And in this particular case, we, we, we've listened to what our customers and the people that use Dynatrace have been saying to us. And we've come up with a mechanism that allows you to actually know exactly how much Dynatrace you're consuming at any given time. So you're not going to be surprised with uh, a surprise bill at the, you know, at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter, or at the end of the month, whatever it might be. So the idea is that we've actually provide mechanisms within the platform that actually allow you to understand what your current consumption is and then project out where that consumption is going to go. So again, this is all about making sure that you've got a you know a predictable price model and this allows you to basically make better decisions about your observability solution. So keep that in mind. This is something that actually got announced about a couple of months ago now. Uh, I think actually no, it was the beginning of August. But this is new capability and uh, this is definitely something that, you know, it comes up in conversation all the time. And we just wanted to make sure that we mentioned to let people know that this is a part of the Dynatrace platform. So, folks, that's that's the end of the Did You Know session. And we're going to get into why you're here, which is the demo. It's demo time. And this is the part of getting to know Dynatrace that I love the most because you get to interact with us. So today... Our guest solution engineer, David Barron. Now, I've known David Barron for years, and I absolutely love this guy. So David's going to walk us through a demonstration of Dynatrace. And at this point, uh, let's, let's send it over to you, Dave. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks uh, for joining today. Um, so what, what we're going to do today is we're going to cover uh, the very basics of the Dynatrace platform, including the One Agent and the Smartscape and the Davis AI, which is, you know, uh, not, don't get that confused with generative AI, uh, you know, that buzzword that we're hearing today, but real deterministic causal AI. Um, and then we're going to get into uh, what, what a problem can do um, in terms of impacting uh, real users. Um, so we'll look at a problem ticket, uh, a real one, and then I'll showcase a little bit of uh, some of the new platform capabilities. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Grail, uh, which is our brand new storage architecture, which is a causal data lakehouse purpose built for deterministic AI. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into some of the views of that data really kind of built for that analytics use case. So we're, we're gonna showcase the notebooks, uh, some dashboards, and then even um, some of our workflow engine, which is brand new as of February this year. Okay, so let's get started. Um, and uh, you can kind of see I have my own um, dashboard here. 
um, really you, you can you can put any type of data you want uh, really for any persona um, on, on your own dashboard, share dashboards, whatever have you. Um, I am more of kind of an SRE persona. So I like to have my SLO statuses um, for my business, uh, which, which we call easy travel. Um, hey, hey, David, uh, David, sorry, sorry for interrupting, but I'm going to, I'm going to hit you with some questions as we go through here. Because oh, yeah, please, please. What I find with getting to know Dynatrace is that sometimes we have people that, you know, they know observability. And then sometimes we have people that are new to observability. So when you use the term SRE, what does that mean? What, sure. what, what does SRE stand for? It's, it feels like jargonish. Yeah. So um, Google actually defined what we call a site reliability guardian. And it's kind of an iteration on operations where uh, the guardian of the, uh, uh, sorry, SRE, site reliable engineer. Um, we have something called SRG in our um, platform. I'll get into that later. Um, site reliable a reliability engineer is a person that kind of oversees the entire enterprise and makes sure that service level objectives are met for the business. Um, so they're, they're kind of, you know, an architecture or architect or um, operations on steroids. And they're really the gatekeepers of, you know, good performance, uptime, uh, but also revenue generation. If, you know, your, your application is generating revenue, that kind of thing. Fabulous. Great. Thanks for explaining that, David. Keep going. I'm sorry for interrupting. Keep going. Sure. Um, one of my other focuses, though, is um, I, I think user experience is of paramount importance um, to understanding uh, whether or not your application is healthy, right? At the, you know, at the uh, end of the day, it's really all that matters. And so I like to kind of have a view of uh, how my users are perceiving the application. So um, user satisfaction, uh, satisfied, tolerating, frustrated is a really good measure, but also, you know, kind of paring that down to like, uh, um, uh, performance, right? If we have end user latency suddenly go up um, and our counts of users go down, hmm, but what would that mean? Well, we can start pairing that uh, together with other metrics that, you know, might be, um, you know, more, more operations focused, like, uh, you know, resources on uh, compute or uh, maybe, you know, garbage collection in, in the Java stack. But Really, in, in this case, I want to compare it to how our revenue is doing. Like, are we generating revenue? And you can kind of see that we have taken a dip in revenue because of this um, uh, increase in the response time. Okay. So all of that kind of leads into, you know, the business analytics use case, right? We can display any metrics you want um, for any persona on this dashboard, but for me, I'm really concerned more, uh, at, you know, from a holistic picture from the top down. Make sense? Yes, it does. Absolutely. All right. And let's, uh, <clears throat> let's kind of get into um, uh, what we start doing when um, we collect data into Dynatrace. Um, so you've heard the term one agent being thrown out. One agent is our magical technology, um, which is a single agent uh, that is automatically deployed, um, no manual configuration. Um, it updates itself every two weeks uh, without any downtime or impact to your applications. Um, and then, of course, you can control that uh, with change control windows and uh, maintenance events and stuff like that. Now, one agent is just one very powerful way to get a very powerful set of data into Dynatrace, uh, but you can imagine that there are many other ways, uh, two of which one would be remotely monitoring, um, say, an appliance or a component or a platform. And that's why we have uh, what we call extensions and then integrations that um, we, we have built or you can build yourself that ingest data uh, from any source. We also have an open API where you can send any type of data, typically metrics, logs, maybe even traces, spans. Um, all of that uh, is open and ready to um, ingest, right? 
Now, when you get the data into Dynatrace, it's what Dynatrace does with the data that is so different than all other uh, solutions on the market, right? Um, we automate a lot of the work away for you. Um, you know, some solutions you might feel uh, are very painful in, in terms of, you know, having to tag things in order to get filtered views and stuff like that. But because Dynatrace understands the full topology, uh, and that leads me into uh, what we call the SmartScape view, um, that topology understanding is what really uh, drives the power underneath the platform. So topology is kind of exactly what you think it is. It is uh, an understanding automatically of all the dependencies that make up your ecosystem. Um, let's say from, you know, the real user. Um, here we have <clears throat> an open problem. Uh, and by the way, the Davis AI, anytime um, a component or an entity, a piece of data uh, is part of an in-flight problem, part of a root cause, um, Davis AI is going to light that up in red all across the uh, Dynatrace UI. So uh, this easy travel mobile application is red. Now that one is having a problem, but I can see that that mobile app talks directly into this easy travel web server. It's not lit up in red. So I know that that is not in context with, the pro I mean, that, that is not, that component is not part of our problem. Um, neither is the process that runs that service. So we can see a HTTP server there. That process runs on a host, right? This one is a Linux host. And then that host uh, runs in the East 1B US availability zone in AWS, okay? But, uh, you know, we can certainly turn this around from different perspectives <clears throat> and start seeing those dependencies at any level, right? Now, this is not typically a monitoring perspective for users of Dynatrace. This is really a visualization of what the Davis AI is tracking in real time. So any updates to your applications, however dynamic, uh, especially useful in you know, highly dynamic containerized applications like Kubernetes and PaaS, um, all of that is kept track of in real time and new components pop in old components or unused components pop out. Um, this is always kept up to date. You can almost think of it as a CMDB on steroids. And in fact, we do have integrations with uh, say ServiceNow uh, to enrich and create all of the data in your CMDB um, automatically. I know that you know some, or some organizations I work with have teams of people that try to keep up with all the changes and can't. But, um, you know, this is a nice way to kind of feed into the CMDB and always keep it up to date. So, so, so Dave, David, you know, you're, you're talking about CMDB and, um, you know, CMDBs are effectively these large catalogs of my assets uh, that, that are out in my deployments. And, you know, to get that information, you mentioned you have to go through, honestly, like really lengthy uh, discovery processes and and you're you're running scans like every week um, or maybe every day depending upon how you're set up so how often do you need to run a scan to do this uh, none you, you just deploy the one agent or ingest data from external sources and this map builds out automatically so all you have to do to say enrich a uh, service now cmdb is connect Dynatrace via the service graph connector that ServiceNow has built um, and, and maintains, and then you're off off to the races. So, so what you're saying is, what you're saying is that if if I've got a CMDB and I'm running a really complicated, um, you know, Kubernetes deployment, so I've got you know all sorts of pods and I got my nodes and I got all my containers out there and they're spinning up and they're spinning down, um, you know, depending upon the workload that I need, that I don't need to go scan this anymore. That that information just gets pushed into That's our CMDB. Correct. That is correct. Um, in fact, this was purpose built for uh, containerized architectures, especially Kubernetes, um, because you know um, I think. The, the stat was uh, it's five years old now, but I remember a time when it was unheard of when 
we heard uh, that Amazon was deploying apps every seven minutes. That's table stakes nowadays, right? We deployed new, uh, you know, new new containers and new services, microservices every single second of the day. So there's got to be an automated way to keep track of all of this. We cannot do it as humans anymore. Wow, that's that's super cool, Dave. Thanks for going into that detail. Let's take a minute, and uh, we've got some questions starting to build up in our queue. So let's, uh, yeah, okay, well, we, oh, let's start with this one. So what do you think, David? It, how long does it take to implement Dynatrace on the infrastructure and think of it in an EKS-type environment? Sure. Um, what I'll do is I'll just go right into deploy Dynatrace here. And um, you can kind of see that, uh, you know, kind of, tout our, our one agent uh, and, and what it's able to do. Um, but let me just go in and show you. So our, our um, IaaS or infrastructure as a service installs are up here. These are the OSs that we install. Yes, uh, we do support mainframe as well. Um, but you'll see um, PaaS is right below that, including you know, uh, function as a service. But um, for our purposes, for this question, um, we're just going to come in and um, and I don't have permission to you know click these buttons, but um, if you can imagine, just give it a name, right? Usually, I uh, choose the same name as what you've already named your your cluster, um, and then group group can uh, be something like a I, I would say like a, a specific environment um, or, or even a data center, something that, you know, you might want multiple uh, clusters to belong to. Um, and then uh, you just create these two tokens here. That will automatically um, write a dynacube.yaml file, which you then download. Um, you don't have to modify it, but you can. Um, it's got all of the information contained within it to automatically instrument your application with the four kube control commands that uh, are shown here. So you literally just have to create a namespace, apply our operator, uh, which is a Kubernetes YAML. And of course you can download this and store it in, in your own artifactory if you want to. Um, but generally it's, you know, you can just uh, uh, call this command and, and uh, have it download automatically. Um, and then we're going to, um, uh, you know, just deploy our um, operator, uh, which uh, creates a couple webhooks. Um, and then uh, we uh, apply that Dynacube YAML. And once the, uh, once the, uh, once that is done, um, you're actually automatically monitoring um, everything uh, down from, you know, the, the, uh, well, we can show you. <laughs> so, 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 David, while you're switching over, it sounds like it's about like maybe like, you know, less than five minutes worth of five work minutes. here, right? Less than five minutes. And you're probably going to be spending most of your time just waiting for things to either build, right, in the background. And, and that's it. So, you know, that's a great question, uh, uh, Carolina. Uh, that, you know, thank you very much for that. And, um, it, it just, you know, that's that just sort of shows how easy we've made it with the Dynatrace one agent. So that deployment, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, but basically that deployment of the one agent, that's deploying it ultimately in what we call full stack mode. And so not only is it going to start pulling in metrics and information about, you know, what's going on at the underlying Kubernetes level, but isn't that also going to apply our instrumentation for the code that's running within those containers? Yeah, and, and there is where it becomes very magical. Um, it, we, we actually, the one agent is seeing right through the container and bytecode instrumenting the runtime within that container. So what when we do that, um, if, if anyone has uh, heard of uh, the term peer path, that is Dynatrace's... Uh, kind of nomenclature for a distributed trace. Um, but that pure path technology, without any code changes whatsoever or container modifications, we're enabling um, distributed tracing everywhere, on every container, on every runtime, on every pod and node, um, across the whole cluster, and then you know rinse and repeat for the next cluster. Fabulous. That's awesome, David. 
right? Um, All right. We, so we got another question. We're not letting you off the hook. Sure. We're not letting you off the hook. We got another question here. So can Dyna, can the Dynatrace agent pick up security vulnerabilities on assets and notify stakeholders to take action on those vulnerabilities? Um, absolutely. And believe it or not, it is the same one agent that enables application security. So um, w- right now, um, and, and this is fairly mature now, um, uh, that one agent is going to find all sorts of vulnerabilities. Let me just go to a page that kind of lays it out all at once for us. And I don't, it's uh, disabled for me, but you can kind of see that we're, um, we're going to use the one agent to look at all of the loaded libraries in all of your runtimes that you see here. Um, including Kubernetes, right? Um, And then we're going to know based on that, if that vulnerability, um, we're going to match it with the SmartScape topology. So with the SmartScape, we know up, down, left, right, front, and back where that vulnerability is tied. So we can essentially tell you if um, that process has a vulnerability that allows that process or services running in that process to be exposed to the outside internet, which, you know, then it becomes uh, very critical to uh, resolve that vulnerability. Um, But we'll also tell you if there is um, an adjacent database or data source that can be accessed uh, by uh, an intruder uh, with that particular vulnerability. We even go further than just third party vulnerability analytics. Um, And, you know, this deserves a whole session in itself. But, um, uh, you know, code level vulnerabilities, those are zero day vulnerabilities that are part of your first party code. Um, Those are those are vulnerabilities that, um, let's say, your own developers may introduce unbeknownst to themselves. Uh, into your applications. And um, Dynatrace even protects against those automatically. Okay. So, so, so Dave, I feel like we're wheeling around a whole ton of jargon again. Um, we talk yeah. about things like a zero day vulnerability. What, you know, like how, how significant is that? Like how bad can that be? So zero day vulnerabilities are, they are, um, basically vulnerabilities that are taken advantage of um, just all of a sudden on day zero. Um, Nobody knows about the vulnerability. It it is just like a hacker community. Um, We're going to go nuts with this guy. As as much as we can, um, you know, uh, take advantage of that one um, in the uh, short amount of time that we have, because sometimes, you know, uh, security scanners, they will catch these, but, um, what Dynatrace does differently is we can block those attacks immediately and in real time. So, um, you know, rather than having that intruder in your system, uh, you know, stealing information, um, you know, uh, uh, potentially, you know, uh, creating a ransomware attack um, internally, um, we can prevent those situations from happening in the first place. Wow. All right. That sounds awesome. You know, there's like, there's a, the follow-up question for this, you know, is can Dynatrace one agent deploy patches from Microsoft to, you know, fix these security vulnerabilities. So I'm going to take a stab at a piece of this and say in the past, I would say not so much. Now we become a very interesting part of that whole story around that. Right, David? We have. And um, that was part of our workflow engine um, you know, the new, the new third generation platform, including uh, the Grail underlying architecture, but uh, we can now uh, do that. Um, you can do anything you want with any of the data in Dynatrace um, and take action um, on that behalf. So uh, we, <laughs> I, I actually had this tab open uh, because I was going to show you um, all what the the workflow engine looks like, but I, I happen to have the one that um, takes action on a critical vulnerability uh, detection. So um, this one does not fix the vulnerability uh, itself, but um, you can imagine 
changing one of these steps, um, you know, uh, let's just say uh, remoting into a machine and, or, or remotely applying a, a patch for that one. I, um, I would think that this would probably be best used in combination with something like, uh, like an Ansible Tower as an example, where, you know, Ansible Tower has probably got, you know, um, you know it, it has a much more robust mechanism at this place, to, sure does, at yeah. this time and shape to have, you know, administrative access to a remote machine to run an installer, that type of thing. But right. we could use Dynatrace to detect the vulnerability and then trigger that Ansible script and then have Dynatrace check to confirm that that vulnerability has been remediated. That is correct. Yep. And, and these steps are pretty cool because, um, you know, you can create um, all sorts of different conditions and legs of conditions. Um, but, you know, there's, there's always options to loop that task until the vulnerability, say, is resolved or, um, or, or has been um, mitigated. Um, mm -hmm. All, all of the, uh, I, I would say the options are limitless um, in terms of what kind of workflows you can uh, create. So we, we had a quick question that popped up from David that asked, uh, can the security spec replace secure scan tools? So I, I'll, I'll take my stab at this one. And, and here's my feelings on the subject is that um, what Dynatrace does when it comes to uh, AppSec, so our vulnerability detection, our RAS, our runtime application security capabilities, um, they do a very good job of being able to see, you know, where third, po third party vulnerabilities exist. It does a, a very good job of being able to block certain types of attacks, like a JNDI type attack or a SQL injection type attack. Um, but it's it's not intended to replace all of your scanning tools. It is meant to be an additional layer of additive security that you add into your security framework. And so, you know, we've got, you know, AppSec is something that Dynatrace it really sees the value of what observability information brings to the table for answering a lot of really tough AppSec questions. And we're, you're going to see a lot coming from Dynatrace. Uh, on the topic of AppSec, you know, in the future, because now that we've got, you know, we, we, we've we got this visibility into these complex environments, we understand dependencies, we understand relationships, and you're just going to start seeing a lot more coming out from, you know, from us on that topic. It's a great question. And thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I, I would add that um, I believe Gartner is saying that, um, you know, the, the observability as a whole now must encompass security. And, and that's, you think about it, it, it has to be that way because um, of all of the hyperdynamic components that make up our architecture these days, right? Um, and, and developers really own those micro components uh, more so than like a central ops uh, used to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think the onus is really going to shift um, what we're going to start hearing DevSecOps a lot more. Absolutely. Absolutely. One more question. I know Dynatrace can raise INC in service now. Real Incidents. time. Pardon me? Incidents. Yeah. Incidents in uh, service now, real time for uh, audit governance purposes. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know whether or not it's generating a uh, ITSM ticket or an ITOM event, Dynatrace absolutely can push that stuff in. You know, basically near real time into something like ServiceNow, and it all starts from one of our problem cards. So, hey, David, why don't you why don't you walk us through an example of what one of these problem cards are all about? Okay, um, and and let me start by saying that uh, we're not looking at alerts in Dynatrace. Dynatrace doesn't really have the concept of alerts. It has uh, causal problem tickets. Okay, what does that mean? Well, instead of uh, generating a whole bunch of alert noise, right, and then having humans have to correlate or, or maybe even machine language correlate uh, certain alerts together to arrive at potential root cause, uh, the Dynatrace deterministic and causal AI is not using correlation, it's using causation, meaning that it understands all of the connectedness, remember SmartScape, 
all of the dependencies. That's what makes deterministic AI possible and causation. So without that, it's not possible because um, really what, what we're doing here is we're using um, same technology as NASA and FAA. Um, it's called fault tree analysis. And uh, we're marrying all of our connected data sets together, starting from real user, infrastructure metrics, host and process health, uh, technology metrics, network health, uh, logs and events, um, of course, topology, uh, but also any other ingested metrics that come along with that. And it's looking at the actual uh, evolution of the problem over time. So what Dynatrace will do is generate one problem and um, it may have a whole bunch of underlying um, alerts underneath it. Um, and I'll show you the, the evolution map here, which you can replay over time. Um, but, you know, problems first start out, right? They might start small or <laughs> hell, they might start really, really big. But um, as that problem lives and, and uh, Dynatrace will create one instant in ServiceNow um, to bring the conversation back, that instant remains open until Dynatrace determines there is no impact or um, or, or problem uh, that remains, okay? At that point, Dynatrace then closes the ServiceNow incident, okay? Um, I hope that answered the question. It, it, it does, David. I think there was a follow-on question on this topic from Carol, and she was asking about what other information is getting pushed to ServiceNow. Sure. Um, so all of the information that you see here and of course, um, we can enrich, uh, let me go over to one more problem ticket I had open um, because this one has um, enrichment events. So you can always uh, enrich uh, the events that the AI is uh, looking at and, and events are very important for deterministic AI, um, even more so than you know looking at change points in, in uh, metric time series. But, um, this one is a ServiceNow integration event, um, which, you know, we can attach any type of metadata, including the affected CI. Uh, here we have a link to our uh, auto remediation uh, runbook. Um, but, you know, you can imagine that um, the product owner and maybe the, uh, the build or Git uh, commit number, those are important pieces of metadata as well that can follow along with that instant as it makes its way into service now, okay? But all of the information you do see here, um, including you know the main stuff, which is the exact root cause, check destination service is, uh, a, is the root cause where we saw a response time degradation event. Um, and then we know that that problem affected um, 500 users, real users, um, but all, all on two applications, okay? And uh, by the way, uh, if, if we ever needed to, um, we can come in and quantify the, uh, the response time degradation itself because Dynatrace auto baselines basically almost every metric, um, especially, you know, uh, response time, throughput, error rates, um, uh, how many times a uh, transaction type hits a database, right? Um, it, it's uh, tracking all of that um, automatically. So it, with Dynatrace, you never have to, but you can never have to really ever create uh, any thresholds. You never have to define alerts. It just all works out of the box. Hopefully that helped. It did. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, here's another question. Uh, how do we how do we set up custom metrics in Dynatrace? Is, can you provide us an example? Sure. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, we could, um, uh, you know, I would uh, go right into um, um, uh, our settings here. Right. All of this is doable um, just by uh, coming in here, and um, there is something uh, called. Uh, um, service metrics. And uh, we just kind of give it a name, um, what kind of metric source, you can provide a unit, 
Um, you can pare it down with what we call a management zone. It's our fancy word for global filter, right? It's just a, a set of rules that you define, uh, which tell Dynatrace what that zone or that filter should um, filter down uh, data for. And then um, you add your conditions. So uh, basically any condition you can think of, um, uh, you know, could be like a, a runtime uh, executable name or uh, uh, Kubernetes namespace or uh, container uh, container name or ID, right? Um, you just give a condition and then um, and then uh, uh, tell it whether you want to split that by dimensions to make it, uh, you know, to add cardinality to it. Um, but then once that is done, um, that's it's all working for you then. And, 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 and David, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can actually do this also programmatically through our APIs. We can. Dynatrace is an API first uh, solution company. Um, so everything that you see in the AI, or sorry, the um, UI and more is already available via our API. Um, and that is uh, obviously well documented and um, available to you through the um uh, person icon at the top right of your tenant. Very cool. Perfect. Thanks, David. All right. Did we have a, I think we got some other questions coming in. Can we convert the classic dashboard to the new dashboard without creating them from scratch? Gotcha. Um, so not currently, um, but I have heard through the grapevine that yeah. there might be some utility to do that in the, in the near future. That's but. Right. I do want to make a distinction between both the classic UI or classic dashboards and uh, the Gen 3 uh, dashboards. There, you can almost think of them for, uh, I would say, different personas. Um, Gen 3 really is very powerful for um, analytics use cases. And the classic dashboards are very powerful for uh, technical use cases um, in general. Um, so that's a really good way of uh, differentiating between the two, David. That's a sure. really good way of doing it. You're right. It is very much uh, based on, you know, someone's persona, right? And really? Yeah. If, if I was, if I was doing a, uh, if I was doing a, a check for, um, you know, I was doing like a query using our DQL, then, you know, I'm going to be playing around inside of our notebooks and I'm going to be using the, the, you know, third gen dashboards. Whereas if I'm, trying to you know display metrics over time you know it might be, be easier to do something like that in a classic dashboard yeah yeah and and you'll kind of get the hang of it classic dashboards as far as i know are never going to go away yeah uh, absolutely and as, as there is actually another question in there from um in our queue it's from banja biswal and he says he's asking a question about on the services how on the hex on the hex view? How do we get it so you can actually see like a name on there? Oh, we actually got yeah. this queued up. So maybe if we could get our control room, uh, John in the control room, if he could just switch uh, to Thank my you. screen sharing for a second. There we go. Uh, let me flip into this view right here, which is the data explorer. So here, what I've done is in our data explorer to get that kind of honeycomb view. Um, I've actually selected a, in this particular case, uh, happens to be CPU request utilization, but this could be quite honestly, just about any type of metric that we have, you know, that's available to you. So here, what I've done is I said, I want this to be displayed as a honeycomb and I've got this split out by my container name. Now, your question was, how do I get it? So I can actually see like the label on here. All you have to do is go over in the uh, data explorer and click on show labels. And there you go. That's it. Uh, in England, they would say Robert is your father's brother or Bob's your own. <laughs> be clever about that. But no, that was a that was a very good question. Thank you very much for that one. So let's let's go back to let's go back to David's screen and let's get back into finishing up with a couple of demo items. And I, I have a feeling um, I'm going to answer multiple uh, questions that have gone unanswered so far with this one topic. Okay, um, and and just bear in mind, um, I'm going to bring this, uh, you know, to what I 
already said is the most important data set, the real user information, the, the experience. Um, but what do we do when, um, when our application has a problem? What, what does Dynatrace do differently than other solutions uh, to get you to an answer uh, immediately? And I would just say, look at a Dynatrace problem ticket. Um, remember, it is not a flood of alerts. It's one problem ticket that might encompass 100, 1,000 alerts all in one problem. And it lives, that problem ticket lives over the whole problem lifecycle from start to finish. And, um, you know, we see the root cause. This is not a guess. It is using that sophisticated fault tree analysis and deterministic AI to understand every data set all at once and then understand the causal um, uh, relationships between everything to figure out what actually was the problem, the, the root cause problem, all right? Um, so here we have our, um, you know, kind of the dig into the problem to figure out what it is. I'm gonna really very quickly click on that to show you what the technical folks will do. Um, so we have this um, HTTP 500 internal server error uh, request that failed where it was store booking. So you can uh, probably imagine store booking. Booking is what makes our application money, makes our company money, right? Not real money. <laughs> but, um, you know, then we kind of get down into um, the really cool stuff here. Here's the developer's dream. We have the exact stack trace, the exact uh, pieces of code that, you know, our developers might need to look at if this is, um, in fact, a developer issue. But we also have Dynatrace AI pulling all of the relevant logs from the entire application ecosystem all on one page for us. We don't have to go digging anymore. Uh, Dynatrace is able to do this automatically. And guess what? Um, we have all of those log events completely tied to um, the uh, full topology. Um, let me pick a different one because that one wasn't uh, connected to a trace. Well, I'll tell you, Dave. So, you know, I'm old school when it comes to this kind of stuff. And in the past, I can remember what this would be. This would be all of a sudden I, as a developer, would tell that to that machine. <laughs> yeah. I would then grep for some log. And then I would start grepping through using some incomprehensible regex that may oh, or yeah. may not work to look for the particular string I'm interested in. And maybe I'll find that needle in the haystack. Meanwhile, I'm probably, as that developer who really knows, knows how the application works, I'm like the top talent within that organization. And now I'm just spending all my time sifting through logs. That's right. But it's all on one page for you. You do not have to go grepping, telenetic, <laughs> old school style, or you know, go to other log analytics solutions. Um, it's all right here for you, um, and it's all in context. So we can take that, uh, you know, from from errors to logs to distributed traces. Uh, I'll show you one of those really quickly here. Um, remember the, the distributed traces are completely automatic, no changes to your code, or uh, if you're containerized, no changes that you need to make. It's all completely automatic. Um, here we see one that um, has two failures, two exceptions. And here the store booking is what Dynatrace AI said was the problem, right? Um, and uh, we can kind of see if we come down here, yep, we have a 500. And then down at the very bottom here, we have the actual developer readable exception, which is also kind of right here. And guess what? Um, this actually is a common developer mistake where they forget that arrays are, you know, you, you start counting from zero. Um, so this says that there is no item six in this array of six, uh, six fields right, because it only goes to five. So they're trying to get an item that's outside the bounds of the array. Anyway, that's a developer issue, but we have all of the evidence um, that the developer would ever need here available to us. Um, but, you know, let's just say we have a couple people looking at this uh, particular problem. And I'm gonna go back to the problem um, and then focus more on the left. Left side of the problem ticket is the impact section. 
Um, but specifically the business impact analysis, right? Um, it is one thing to understand the exact root cause. It is something completely different to understand how that problem affected your users. So this says that when users were trying, 42 of them were trying to validate credit card, uh, they got an error. And we can kind of see down here um, that they got a JavaScript uh, error on their uh, page and it said E1234, who knows what that means, right? Um, but if you remember um, from the, the trace that I showed you, that exception said E1234 on it, which is really a non-descriptive error. But let's go to the real magic. So I'm gonna look at this from the actual real user. Um, and we're gonna take a look at, um, uh, here we have uh, only one username uh, because we can tag users by any identifier if you'd like. If you don't tag, they'll just show up as anonymous to hide their identity. But um, in our case, we, we pull out their login name and uh, tag their sessions with that, okay? So I'm gonna come into this one uh, user session, uh, Hainer Hastings, and this person is coming from Munich, Germany, who's using Chrome 101. Imagine you can um, do all sorts of cool business analytics on any of this data, um, even you know just pulling data out from the pages that the users are seeing, like loyalty status or what they are, um, you know, searching for when they book a trip. And of course the revenue um, so that we can track revenue um, for all users all the time in real time. Anyway, um, as we scan down, we can kind of see areas of frustration here, um, but then their entire journey is available uh, for us to look at. Um, here is a completely behavioral issue called a rage click. That's when a user clicks very rapidly on, on some element or object on the page, um, usually means that they're frustrated. But yeah, the, the one, um, pro, I, I said the one um, action that preceded that was the validate credit card. Remember, um, a, the Davis AI said that that was uh, what, pro, uh, what the users um, were being frustrated with. Okay, um, before I, actually, before I go into the waterfall for that particular uh, frustration, I'm gonna just show you what this problem looks like from the actual real user's perspective. Um, I'm putting my mouse at the very top of the screen. So any mouse movement that you see as this is playing, and I'll, I'll put it in 2X here. Um, I've, got my, I've got my hands off the keyboard as well. So, you know, hands up in this particular case. Yes, this hands is actual up. video being played back and not us messing with things. And watch what happens when um, they get here. Okay, I'll, I'll pause it uh, because this is um, the the you know the mic drop moment, right? That's that error that we saw um, on the problem ticket detail. We also saw that error in the stack trace on the distributed trace. We also saw it in the log file with um, that also contained the full stack trace of the problem. So um, the, this problem actually manifested visually for the user. It's not, not very good user experience in my opinion, but um, you'll, as I press play again here, you're gonna see them try to click on this gray button, which doesn't work for them. Um, and that's gonna denote that rage click that we're talking about. So you can almost imagine like, okay, if the user just paid for a trip or they thought they did, um, what are they gonna do if they can't get the tickets or know if they even actually book the trip? Well, your call center is gonna get flooded um, depending on how many other people are having this problem too. So um, knowing the problem, right? Um, which this one was a JavaScript error caused by a developer issue or developer error in the backend code. Um, seeing this visually, um, you know, it really kind of brings context to it. And then obviously um, either post-mortem or in real time, you can always get to the, the down deep details um, and understand, uh, you know, really what, what is the, um, we know that the, uh, uh, easy, sorry, the uh, 
store booking service was the root cause uh, that Davis A had picked out. But you can go from the real user action all the way to the distributed trace. Yeah. Hold on, Dave. You just, I feel like you've kind of buried the lead there. You like literally, you just walked through it and it was like you're going from this is a user and this is what the user saw in their, you know, in their device. And you just trace that all the way back. Yeah. Let me show you that again. Um, Coming here, right? Because right when they click this button, then they get that E1234 error. So we're going to go to that action, perform the waterfall analysis. You can see that JavaScript error right there. But we also see a request that failed on our bookings call. And then we just view the trace, and we're back here to the technical detail. And, and David, let me ask you this leading question. What did you have to do to configure your observability solution to provide that end-to-end view? Nothing. Just install the one agent um, to enable our distributed tracing. Uh, you can certainly, if you're already taking advantage of open telemetry, uh, let Dynatrace ingest your traces and spans. Um, we'll make sense out of all of those. We'll build them all back together into their full traces, connect them automatically to your real user activity, um, to your infrastructure health, to your logs, uh, to network health, events, uh, whatever have you. It's what we do with this data that is different, um, including the deterministic AI, which is causation, not correlation. It's absolutely fabulous, David. You know what? Uh, I, I'm afraid we're we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to have to wrap things up. Any any final comments? Any final things you want uh, you want to throw in there, David? No, I'll uh, just leave it open for questions. Well, actually, you no, know, we're at the top of the hour yeah, and we've had of lots hour. of questions. So that, Sorry. Um, no, no, we got to wrap things up. Time. Listen, David, thank you so much for walking us through that. You know what? You spent a lot of extra time going through a lot of the upfront, uh, those AppSec questions, that last part of the demo where you are walking us through a JavaScript error, actually tracing that all the way back to the an issue on the back end and just being able to do it in one click amazing david just absolutely amazing thank you so much really appreciate it and folks as always with getting to know dynatrace what makes it so special are your questions and you threw a lot at us today and they came from all sorts of different perspectives so thank you for that that's that's really what we look forward to is getting on and being able to you know have turn this into a dialogue you ask us questions and and being able to go back and forth like this so absolutely fabulous Thank you so much, everyone. If you're new to Dynatrace, feel free to take it for a spin. Go to Dynatrace.com. You can sign up for a free trial. And remember, coming up is Perform 2024. So keep that in mind. Think about it. Start planning for it now. We look forward to seeing you all out there. And finally, the last thing I'll say is come to the next Getting to Know Dynatrace session. We'll be doing it in another couple of weeks. Uh, We always have fun with these and uh, thank you very much for your time. And with that, so long folks, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, David.